Hey everyone, welcome to Mountain Woman Radio. This is episode number 205 and I am your host, Tammy Treyer. You can find myself and my family educating on our off-grid, faith-led lifestyle at treyerwilderness.com. Today, I have a special guest with me today. It is my mountain man. We thought we would take the time today to share our story. What do you think? I guess. You guess? It's quite the story. I guess. <laughs> the male versus female perspective on things. For those of you that purchased my How to Embrace an Off-Grid Lifestyle, you heard a good bit of our story in the introduction of that book. But I felt it was important for us to share our story because for many of you that have been following us specifically for the last four years, um, you have seen God's presence incredibly with many miracles and all kinds of crazy stuff. But God was very present in the very beginning of our relationship in a very big way as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, little backstory. I ended up on a 150 acre farm in uh, north central Pennsylvania uh, due to an abusive marriage. So the mountain boy, um, my son, who is a is high functioning autistic, and I were living there on the farm. And when I always say this, and he laughs at me, when I landed there, da -da -da, psh, <laughs> when I landed on the farm, she parachuted in. I did. It was crazy. C one thirty went over, and she dropped and <laughs> with all her stuff. <laughs> That's what it looked like. Mm. <laughs> a bomb went off. But anyway, um, I was determined to grow old by myself and raise my son. I was very disappointed in the farm because I wanted to raise my son in a cabin in the woods. Um, that was just unbeknownst to me in my future. But it didn't take me long to get really acquainted and happy with the farm. There was a big mountain range um, about what? 200 yards off the front porch. No, it's further than that. 300. No, it's further than that. It's, it's a good... Scoot and oh, a jiggle. I'd, I'd say probably mile over there to the, to the mountain, where the mountain starts going up. Oh, so okay. But go the, down the field and cross the creek and okay. to the other side. So the mountain range is a mile, but the creek river is about 300 yards from the front porch. Yeah. And I sit out in my swing with a cup of coffee in the morning and watch the eagles teaching their young how to fly. It was really awesome. I mean, it was a great spot. It was a great spot to start <laughs> raising the mountain boy. And then <clears throat> he showed up. It's been downhill for her ever since. <laughs> it was actually pretty funny. Um, my landlord hired um, the contractor that he was working for and uh, they were working on the silo and my dog decided to run over and meet him one day and that's how we initially met and then and had good conversation and he shared with me that he had just returned a few months before uh, well beginning of the year we met in August so beginning of the year he had returned from Wyoming uh, was guiding pack trips and stuff I'll let him share his story then um, but he's, I, I'm like, why did you return to Pennsylvania, you know, when you have the opportunity to be out west? And so, tell them some of the wild and crazy things you were doing before you met me. Which ones? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good. I, well, yeah. you enjoyed being wild and crazy on the back of a bull. I rodeoed for ten and a half years. Um, about four, four, four and a half years of that is how I made my living. Um, yeah, I've traveled all over. I've been in what every state, but like three or four. Yeah. Three or four of them. Yeah. Um, so I've I've been all over the place. Um, 
other countries been around. So, um, I guess when I was, let's see, I've uh, been like 22 when I really started rodeoing hard. I did a little bit before when I was like 18. And then several of the years there I didn't. And then I started getting into it pretty heavy. Um, and uh, yeah, I rode bulls and bareback horses. And then uh, guided hunts and guided pack trips and uh yeah lived in the woods lived in the woods mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff crazy stuff kind of feed each other's fire we're both a little bit of adrenaline junkies in ways him a lot more than me but we both tend to have a little bit of a fire there so when i met you you were kind of on the same page in some ways that I was um, with your previous girlfriend dying in a car accident you kind of put up a lot of walls and decided kind of okay yeah that's an understatement isn't it I had <laughs> I needed a chisel <laughs> but tell them what you said to me when I asked you why in the world you returned of all places to Pennsylvania. I wasn't sure I wasn't sure. Um, I mean, now looking back on it, I know God had his hand in it. But at the time, I didn't know, you know, I had no clue why the ranch, the one ranch I, had, I was working on, um, they went under. So, and I easily could have got work other places, easily. Out there. Um, yeah. I mean, I had bunch of connections I had guys asking me to come work for them and stuff and easily could have got work uh, so I didn't I didn't though I just I, I went back to Pennsylvania um, where I was born and raised I was born and raised in a farm um, not far from where she ended up moving to um, <coughs> and uh, I moved back there and was working for a good friend of mine doing construction work and uh yeah i had no clue why i was i'd moved back i moved back and not long after i was back i was like why in the world did i ever do this <laughs> and i'm like i hate the humidity i just all the people i just i'm not a big people person i like people um but i don't like lots of people at one time it just kind of drives me nuts and I don't like people behind me and stuff so um yeah I uh we do a little bit of wondering what in the world you were doing too yeah I was wondering why I even moved back and uh you know now I know it was to meet her um but at the time I did I had no clue I had no clue why I'd moved back instead of just going to work for another ranch or outfitter or something like that. Especially um, when that's something that was like really calling your heart at the time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty crazy. And the second time I met him, he scared the bejeepers out of me. I'm sitting in my office on the farm working on websites and I hear this scream and I look out and he's hanging off of a cherry picker going up alongside the the uh, silo I didn't know he was so, laughing if you don't know what a cherry picker is what we call a cherry picker it's a man lift mm. um, it's you got a basket it's kind of like um, a big fork truck but it has a basket in front and you raise up and you can work off of it and I I was hanging off the bottom of it my uh, my boss um, was messing around he said well if you're not ready I'm going up and he started going up so I jumped and grabbed all the bottom and he just kept going it wasn't <laughs> OSHA approved no no, no. <sighs> but, but yeah but he scared me I didn't realize that he was goofing off until I went out in the porch like ran out in the porch and then I could hear them laughing and carrying on but definitely made my heart beat fast 
and it wasn't quite for him yet <laughs> not directly but it was just kind of funny how things worked out um, Austin had a um, fella coming and working with him on the farm his name was Craig and he was helping him um, just through the struggles he was having uh, getting involved in a new school and it was just added support and Craig was phenomenal a great man real angel um, he was previously a preacher and just had a big heart and um, I had to take Austin back and forth to his biological father every other weekend and the one weekend shortly after meeting him I took Austin down there and this panel van pulled up in front of me and this guy pulled over at an angle and he flung the door open threw his leg up he was wearing shorts and he's got flip-flops on and his hairy leg and his gangly toes and he's smoking a cigarette and I just got mad I just got absolutely mad because I didn't ever want to learn another man's habits idiosyncrasies not that I don't have my own but I just didn't want to and and Craig was dealing with Austin but he and I had a lot of really deep conversations too and then Austin and I were on the porch one night and we were and this is all within a matter of like a week's time we were making chicken and my girlfriends kept saying to me you're too young to grow old by yourself and I said okay if a guy shows up on my porch wearing cowboy boots, a pair of Wranglers, fresh off the ranch, and says yes ma'am to me, and is like Pastor Dan from the movie Raising Ellen, because it, it was, Pastor Dan was really outgoing, really wild and crazy, and didn't fit the mold of a normal preacher. He, but he was very, very spiritual and very faithful, and, and a real God-fearing man. So he comes down the lane. I'm making chicken. Well. Yeah. Share your story of the come. He was coming down to shoot pigeons. There was in the barn there that we were working on the silo and stuff. I mean on the barn a little bit. Um there was a bunch of pigeons all over the place and they were crapping everything up and it was just nasty. So the landlord had us working on another one of their barns. Um so at another farm and I was talking to the landlord a little bit about her um, and then I asked if I could go down and shoot pigeons. Pigeons. Which I had a little other other intentions. Intentions. <laughs> but you know. Um, the gun never came out <laughs> of the truck. I went so I start down there and I the lane her lane was like a mile long down to the farm and i'm driving down there and i'm like man what am i doing <laughs> what am i doing this is stupid turn around tell myself <laughs> turn around turn around turn around and I'm like well you know what i'll go down i'll tell her i'm there to shoot pigeons i'll just say i'm there to shoot pigeons <laughs> i'm let her know what's going on i'm gonna go get the gun just go and uh went down and walked up on the porch to tell her I was shooting <laughs> pigeons. And, yeah. <laughs> he also had pictures from Wyoming that he also brought, which he did have in his hand. And he, he was. No, you said something about we. A little bit later, you said something about. I forget what it was, and I had pictures in the truck, and I went and got them. And I was them thinking back. you had them in your no. hand. But anyway, he comes up on the porch to tell me, and I'm like, I'm like, would you like something to drink? Yes, ma'am. Wearing his Wranglers and his cowboy boots. I'm like, oh boy. So I got him a glass of water, and we got talking, and then he did show me the pictures, and I always made a lot because that way I had leftovers. It made it easy as a single mom to just throw things in the pan and heat it up. <clears throat> So I had a lot of chicken on the, on, the, on the grill. And I said, well, we're going to be eating anyway. Do you want to join us? So he joined us for dinner and proceeded to stay on my back porch with me. She till kidnapped me till like 2, two or 3 o'clock in the morning. 
And what was really awesome is I had the most amazing conversation I've ever had with a man, and he proved to be my pastor, Dan, which was really crazy to me because uh, I was just so determined. But God had softened my heart, and I still wasn't sure, though. But he headed off to get a little bit of sleep before he started work again. And I had someone helping me on the farm named Julie. And Julie came in that day and she happened to be sitting in my desk and I was sitting on the floor sorting papers. And she's like, what's up with you today? She's like, you're really different. And Julie knew my story. Julie, I met Julie shortly after I got there. And because of my emotions and the things that were going on, I couldn't conceal my story. You know, I shared. And, uh, so she asked what was going on with me, and I'm like, this guy showed up last night and ended up staying till 2 o'clock in the morning. I said I had the best conversation ever. I said it was just amazing. And she's like, what was his name? I'm like, his name was Glenn Treyer. And she threw her hands up to her face and just started bawling. <laughs> it still makes me cry. I didn't know why she was crying at first, but I mean, she was really... So she starts crying because she's <laughs> crying, and they're crying because and they nobody cried knows together. what they're crying. And, and, you know, <laughs> women stuff, you know. It was, but it wasn't just like your little, like, oh, just tears flying. I mean, she was bawling. And when she finally stopped, she said, she goes, you will never believe this. Her son was really good friends with him growing up. She knew his circumstances of losing um, his previous girlfriend and had been praying for him for those six years to find somebody to, to care for because he was such a loving person. And knowing my circumstances, she had been praying <laughs> for me to find somebody to love me and love me the love me right and she never in a million years thought that those prayers would collide so it was really really powerful confirmation for me that he was okay and that he was if I was going to step out I guess that's a matter of opinion <laughs> I suppose if I'm okay or not right I think you're alright I hope so <laughs> You're stuck with me now. I am for forever and ever. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> <coughs> so that was a really strong confirmation that if I was going to step into this and, and, and try this, that he was safe. And uh, it, it just got crazier from there because that was one of our first confirmations. But then when we got to talking, we found out that our entire family knew each other, going back to my grandparents, who have been deceased since I was 10, knew each other, hung out together. His grandparents and my grandparents hung out together. My aunts and uncles knew him in the family. Um, my, my dad knew of his parents. But we had never met and that was just really crazy to me um my when i was young my parents moved out of the valley to culture us and i often wished that they hadn't because where i was cultured was very eye-opening and the men were nothing like him nothing however everything happens for a reason and it made me who i am today and the very strong person that i am today because of what i experienced and what i went through growing up but I would have traded that in a heartbeat for him. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Ain't that sweet? That's so special. <laughs> so it was crazy, and he laughs at me when I say this, but I'm going to share a couple things. One of the things I'm going to share, he laughs at me about. But when I moved there, my landlord just could not, neither of them, husband or wife, could understand why I wanted to live at the end of a mile-long lane in the middle of nowhere by myself. It was the most amazing place to regroup and heal. I'd go out at night with a headlamp on, and sometimes even without the headlamp, and walk that mile lane in a full moon, 
you know, I had already put Austin to bed and I'd go out and I'd, I'd just go for a walk in the moonlight or sit on my porch till late hours and just take it all in. But it really was a great spot to heal. But there was one day when I was walking on the lane and it was just like in the movies, how they have everything, the scenes are all spinning around and all of a sudden you see the path you took to get you where you are. And it was just so clear to me and so just like, I don't even know how to put it into words. It was just really crazy to see how God had his hand on me and brought me there and, and the events that took place. And then to know, you know, that he ended up on the farm and back in Pennsylvania and really had no desire to be there, but was there. And our story from there is just kind of crazy. One thing that always sticks out to me is Craig. <laughs> We were uh, there one night when Craig came and Craig sat, we were all sitting at the table and Craig said, you know, he's talking to Glenn, he says, you know, you met her a week sooner, you wouldn't have had a chance. And it was so true. I was just in such a hardened place. But it's amazing what God can do. Hmm. It's really amazing what God can do in our lives. And... You know, oftentimes we think through bad circumstances that nothing good can come of it. But that's why I wanted to share our story today. It's like, so, it's just been from the time I met him, even till now. And you guys know, those of you that have been following us the last four years, you know the struggles I've been going through and what we've been going through because what I'm walking out, he and Austin have been walking out too. And... And then our financial struggles, and it, it's been hard, but God has been so, so ever-present. You know, when you were bull riding, this is a really crazy thing. I hadn't even met him, but about a year before we met, I loved watching bull riding. I love PBR. I love <laughs> Wranglers. And <laughs> cowboy boots. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, ma'am. That's not why you like the Wranglers. <laughs> <laughs> I like the W's. <laughs> PG, PG. <laughs> anyway, what was really funny is um, my family had just moved back up to where they were born and raised. And it, of course, was right where he was born and raised. So I knew the area they were in. I knew some of the towns. And a year before I met him, I'm watching PBR, and it was so funny because he lived in Dalmatia, and the guy... Well, our well, address was Dalmatia, right. but we were like 20 minutes from... Okay, but the address was Dalmatia, <laughs> and the guy gets on and he says, this guy's from, and I didn't remember the name of the writer, but he says Dalmedia. And I'm like, wow, he butchered that, but I know right where that's at. That's somebody up in, you know, my parents' stomping ground. And um, a year later when I met him, it was him because he was the only one from that area r riding PBR at the time. So it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. I didn't ever, you know, I saw that ride. I remember that ride, but it's like I didn't. You know, it wasn't like it was really watching him. It's, I wanted to see him in person riding, but that was <laughs> that was a thing of the past when I met him. Yeah, I'd gotten out of I'd gotten out of bull riding by that point. Um, I've had <laughs> <laughs> I've had seven major concussions um, that he knows of. Yeah, that I know of, but seven major concussions. Yeah. Um, and truly, and they're not a laughing matter. It's just one of, we'll explain further. That's, that's the, the major ones, not, that, not uh, the, uh, the ones that are just black out for a second and you're back kind of to it. Like his seven are like coma for yeah, but, a long period of time. And but uh, I quit riding because... Um, one of my last real bad accidents, bull riding. Um, the seven major concussions aren't all from just bull riding. It's from car accidents, car accidents, football, just 
all kinds of stuff. It's um, wild, man. Um, but my last one was pretty much from a uh, bull caught me up. I was wearing a helmet and face mask, and it caught me up under the face mask and uh, shattered my jaw and messed up all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, because it pushed the bottom, his bottom jaw up yeah, into his it top jaw. I mean, it was dislocated both of the joints and sent the front part of my jaw here up into the roof of my mouth. And I was very grateful I did not. <coughs> yeah, all kinds of good stuff there. Um, but the uh, the doc told me he said, uh, you know, you can keep on riding, but he said I'm not guaranteeing what'll happen your next concussion. Um, you could, uh, you know, you could be a vegetable the rest of your life. So I did some, I rode a little bit after that, um, probably about a half a year after that I rode. Uh, but I was doing some real uh, thinking about what the doc said and uh, I, I figured it was, it was probably about time to to hang it up. Um, I wasn't really ready to hang it up. I was starting to do really well. Um, I was riding really well at that point. Uh, and I'm pretty big for my, for being a bull rider. Um, but I was doing, I was doing pretty good. It was really bad um, when he was on a small bull. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, one of the ones was, uh, he was on, uh, I forget how many show, PBR shows he was on, but uh, ear take 61. He was a smaller bull, but he'd get guys, uh, a lot of guys jerked down and uh, mess up their face and stuff. Uh, but I, I ended up riding him in a short go. And uh, yeah, it was, he's small bull, kind of like uh, blueberry wine, if anybody remembers him. I was just gonna say. A small bull. Um, <laughs> your legs kind of like wrap underneath them. It's, it's <laughs> not uh, real easy to ride. Not but, ideal. No, no. But, um, but yeah, it, it was one of those things that I just decided that, you know what, it, uh, as hard as it might be, um, I think it's time. It's time for me to hang it up. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That was six years prior to meeting me, and while we've been here the 10 years, he has struggled with uh, the urges to get out there. It's, it's really part of his makeup, and I totally get that. I totally, totally get that. Yeah, there was, there was times um, that I, you know, thought about getting back into saddle bronc riding, um, which I only, I only did a couple of saddle bronc courses. Uh, but a uh, man that uh, won Cheyenne rodeos uh, one year, um, he offered to train me um, for free. He said I was built for it and everything. And I just I was at the height, kind of the height of my uh, bull riding, and I didn't didn't pursue that. And I probably should have because saddle bronc riders tend to. Stay in the game a little bit longer. Not um, as harsh on the body. Not, uh, yeah. However, had you done that, we wouldn't have met. So no, no. It's kind of not. you know. You know, God has his reasons and his purpose. Yeah, but it's hard for him. It's really hard for him. I, I've watched, it's, and I get it. I totally it's, get it. You know, it's no different than you do something that you love and you really enjoy for uh, a good bit of your, you know, ten and a half years of your life. You know, it's kind of hard to, oh, yeah. to give it up and stuff, it. but... It's like my motorcycle. Yeah. It's like part of me, too. But that's like riding a bike, so yeah. just jump back on and go. But, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like anything else, you know, is running uh, pack trips and stuff into the back country and guiding hunts and stuff on uh, horses and mules and, and that, working on ranches and stuff. and. You know, that I kind of miss that stuff too at times, but 
Yeah. We still talk about incorporating that into what we do here, but you know, that's it's in God's hands. All of it's in God's mm -hmm. hands. We're just uh, waiting for doors to open and Him to show us the way. Thank you guys for joining us on Mountain Woman Radio. This is episode number 205, so you can go to treyerwilderness.com slash podcast-205. And we look forward to chatting with you on the next podcast because I'm going to have him back. So join us next time. And until then, take care and God bless. God bless.